We're in Luke chapter two, verses seven through 16. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you'll recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby laying in the manger. Today, we're going to talk about who God invited as VIPs to the very first Christmas. Let's take a second to pray. Father God, thank you that we have this opportunity to be in your house. Thank you that in the crazy of the Christmas season, there's a place that is an oasis of peace, an oasis um, that is a place that is safe, where we are loved and accepted exactly as we are. That's what you do for us. That's what we do for each other. In these moments, I know a lot of us are here for a lot of different reasons. Some of us were dragged here and don't really wanna be here. Some of us have not had enough coffee. Uh, others are here because we are desperate for a touch from your hand this holiday season. Somebody is at rock bottom, somebody is hurting, somebody came to pray for someone else. All the reasons we're here, but we know that because of this story and what we learn in it, that we are loved and accepted around the manger. And I just pray that you'll speak to each of us exactly what we need because you are a very personal God. All glory to you in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, before you sit, find someone near you and ask them this question or just tell them your answer to this question. If you were gonna have a Christmas party and you wanted it to be the most interesting Christmas party anybody has ever been to, who would you invite? Anybody in the world, go. The guy from Dos Equis, Pastor Ted. Todd, can you take that picture down for just a minute? Thanks. Also from the behind me. Todd, make it go away. Thank you. You guys can be seated. What did you hear besides what we heard from Pastor Ted backstage, the Dos Equis guy, the most interesting man in the world? Aaron Rodgers? You would. Boy, could you be any more representing right now? It's okay, we love you. Uh, because everybody's welcome here. I'm surprised that Braden's not weighing in, but he's still backstage. Uh, what did you hear? Elvis. Elvis. And you would say that, Mr. Music. Okay, anybody else, anything good? Ryan Reynolds? That's not the worst idea. <laughs> Last night, Dustin on the front was like, Tom Cruise. I suppose that would be interesting. So my husband, by the way, if you're new here, hi, my name's Kelly. Okay, so uh, my husband, Eric, um, and I pastor this church. Okay, anyway, so moving on. Eric asked me this question this week because we were studying, we were talking about this. And he said, who would you invite? Well, I mean, immediately some names popped in my head, like strong women, you know, but I didn't want to be cliche because I knew all the pastors were going to discuss it and most of them are men. And so I, I wanted to go for the obvious like Michelle Obama. That's not a political statement. It's just like, she's cool, man. Um, <laughs> Susie, sisters. But I was like, you know, that would be great, but that's kind of cliche. So who would be super interesting to have at a party? So my answer was Gary Busey. I was like, that would be interesting. I mean, okay, so if you're like young, <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing young people go, who is that? 
He was in Point Break with Keanu Reeves and Patrick Swayze, also old people. So, you know, but, uh, but in his later years, he's a little woo. Um, and we enjoyed watching him on The Apprentice a few years back, several years back. Uh, back while Trump was doing other things. And um, anyway, he was funny. So we asked around to friends and other pastors on the team, and <laughs> we got a list of answers that I'm going to read to you, but we also decided to put them all in one picture. So here you go. Pastor Jason said Donald Trump. Eric said Ozzy Osbourne. Pastor Kevin said Bob Ross, the painter guy from P PBS. <laughs> He's dead. Um, Silas says, Captain Jack Sparrow, who is not an actual person, Pastor Silas. Pastor Mike said, Dave Chappelle. Brian, Pastor Brian's wife, or Pastor Brian said, Dave Grohl, of course. Yes. And <laughs> is that Chris? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, his wife said, Carrie Underwood. Pastor Ruben said, Kevin Hart, possibly one of the funniest people on the planet, for sure. Uh, Pastor Bruce uh, said Samuel L. Jackson. Someone else said Kim Jong-un. Okay, so in the list, we have all these names of who said it. And then it just says, because Eric compiled the list and sent it to me, someone else said Kim Jong-un. It's like nobody wanted to claim that that was their idea. Somebody else said Pablo Escobar. And Pastor Ben chimed in with Cousin Eddie from Christmas Vacation. Uh, also not an actual person, but that would be interesting. But Randy Quaid, I think that would be pretty interesting. When we think about who God invited to the very first Christmas party ever, we think to ourselves, he could have chosen anybody in the world, honestly, because he's God, he could have chosen anybody from any time period in the world too, if you think about it. I mean, he could have had quite the mix at the manger that night. Um, he could have invited the most popular celebrities of the day, the best musicians, the most prolific artists. He could have invited the wealthy people. He could have invited anybody he wanted. He could have put the birth of Jesus in a palace or on a beach or anywhere, but instead he decided to have this happen in what was a cave in Bethlehem and he invited the most unlikely little group of people to be at that very first Christmas party. So what we're looking at today is who are the people that were at that first Christmas and why on earth would they be the ones that God decided to have there? Are you with me? So we've been pastoring for like 20 years and every year the Christmas story is something we have to preach on. And every year we're like, this is not a new story. But it's kind of fun because uh, we've just kind of got a little different perspective on it this year as we were studying and talking about this. Um, so we realized maybe God had these particular people at the manger that night because he was sh having them there uh, representing people groups. Maybe they were there for who they represent. So we're going to look at the people who were around the manger, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, and then there was an after party with the wise men. I say after party because the wise men actually didn't come to the manger. They came to visit Jesus in his home, but they were the other people who are included in the Christmas story of people who came to see Jesus uh, at his birth or shortly after. So that's what we're talking about, who they represent. Because the truth is, let's the purpose of Free Grace United is what? If you know it, say it with me. Helping as many people as we can cross the line of faith and follow Jesus. Cross the line of faith and follow Jesus, right. And what are the two weekends a year that people are most likely to come to church and hear about Jesus? <laughs> Christmas and Easter. We call them CEOs, Christmas and Easter onlys. <laughs> the VIPs of Christmas and Easter in this house are those who need Jesus. They are those who need to cross the line of faith and follow Jesus. Yes, we do really great services for ourselves so we can come and worship, we can engage, we can be reminded of what Jesus did for us. But this church is always about who else needs to know about Jesus. And so we are unashamed about telling you, bring people to church. Some of you are sitting here today and you're like, I know, they brought me, thanks. <laughs> but you need to know that like, that's what we're about. We don't think it's fair to have the best news in the world and not tell somebody else about it, yeah. right? So as we look at the story, we look who God included in the Christmas party, the very first Christmas party, we need to be thinking who should we be including in the Christmas party this year? 
whether that's just the act of including those people in the good news of Jesus and telling somebody and bringing hope and bringing life and praying over people and caring for people, or whether it's bringing them here to experience church on Christmas Eve. We have a really loud, noisy, crazy world out there full of distractions, right? And you can hear from Jesus anywhere. Like you can hear from Jesus in the shower. You can hear from Jesus uh, while you're taking your dog out to do his business. You can, God can talk to you when you are working, when you're commuting, whatever. But there's so many distractions that get in the way. And this is one of the only places in the world where you can come and be distraction free and just sit and intentionally hear from Jesus if you choose to. You can sit and play on your phone the whole time like a couple of guys did during my sermon last night. That's fun. <laughs> or you can engage and you can be here. And what if we found somebody else to bring here to close out all the other noise and just be able to experience the hope of Jesus this Christmas? So we have Christmas Eve services and maybe God's gonna bring somebody to your mind as we talk about this that you need to bring and include around the manger this Christmas in whatever way that is. So these are the groups of people that we believe are represented at the very first Christmas. The first one is Mary, obviously, she's the one that did all the work. Mary, Jesus' mother, she represents the suffering. She represents suffering, everybody say suffering. I mean, she labored and had a baby in a cave without an epidural, that is suffering. That is suffering when you're in a hospital with flowers and doctors. I know the guys are like, please stop, just please stop now. And the ladies are like, oh no, sister, I feel you. But Mary had suffering obviously as she brought Jesus into the world. But if you think about the suffering that she endured throughout her life because of being the mother of Jesus, obviously childbirth, but uh, she was an unwed mother, an pre unwed pregnant girl. So she was rejected by her community because it jacked up her reputation. She was rejected by her fiance until God intervened. She had to watch her child be tortured and killed, something no mother should ever have to go through. Her life was a life of suffering. Like we look at Mary and we're like, she's famous. They make statues of her and necklaces and like people pray to her and she's kind of a BFD, you know, big freaking deal, Mary. But she had to go through an awful lot of suffering before she got on the other side of that. And in this story, Mary represents those who are suffering. In Luke chapter two, we hear the story about how Jesus's parents, Mary and Joseph, brought Jesus to the temple for his dedication. So we do baby dedications here, right? We bring people up on stage, we pray over them. In other traditions, it's baby baptism. In the Jewish tradition, it's take them to the temple and get them circumcised. I'm glad I don't have to do that, you guys. I'd have to find a different religion. Like, as a pastor, that's not something I want to mess with. Um, but at eight days old, they would bring their boy to the temple, have him circumcised, um, and he would be dedicated. And when they had him in the temple for dedication, a prophet named Simeon saw them, and he was like, oh my gosh. This is the Messiah, like he speaks all this great stuff, you know, this, this is Jesus, he's, he is, who, you know, he's all this. But then he looks at Mary and he says these words, a sword will pierce your own soul too. Imagine if we brought somebody up here for a child dedication, we're like, oh, God bless this baby, and then looked at the mother and said, you're in for a lot of suffering. Now, any mother knows that having kids does mean we suffer a fair amount because having kids is hard. And now I'm at this place where I'm having to let go of my kids and let them make their own choices. And, and, and I'm getting ready to let them fly and just pray that they don't crash. This is tough, I know. Don't even start crying, Susie, that's not okay. But Mary represents those who are suffering. Here's a question, who do you know? We're gonna ask this at the end of each of these groups of people. Is there some person you know who is suffering through the holidays this year? Who do you know? If somebody pops in your mind, write them down. We actually made a spot for you to write it in your note sheet. 
Who do you know who is suffering this year? Maybe it's somebody who's had a medical diagnosis. Maybe it's somebody who's had a marriage abruptly end. Uh, maybe it's somebody who uh, his relationship struggles. Their child is, is wayward. Maybe they deal with depression and anxiety. A lot of people in Minnesota deal with that seasonal dis depression because it's so dang cold here and dark. By the way, the days are getting longer now. It's getting better. It's going, the end is in sight somewhere. Maybe you know somebody who's dealing with a painful rejection. Somebody who's in physical pain. Some friends of ours, their son is in prison and he's being transferred now to a federal prison somewhere in the country and just the fear and not knowing how it's gonna be for him is just all consuming this holiday season. Some have lost somebody <clears throat> over this last year and coming into Christmas, it'll be that first Christmas without them. And the older I get, the more that's a thing, the more that impacts me, the more I have some pain at Christmas time. And actually, we've decided to do something special on these Christmas Eve services on Tuesday. Uh, that we haven't done before, but I think as we get older, we find these things to be a little bit more important. Um, we're going to give an opportunity for people to light a candle in remembrance of someone they're missing this Christmas season. And you know what's amazing was uh, that came out of a woman in our church who lost her mother this year, and she's trying very hard to get her whole, like, like 40 people to come to church with her on Christmas Eve. And I was like, well, we should, you know, have them light a candle for your mom. And she just said, oh, my gosh, I bet they would come for that. And then they'd hear about Jesus. And we were like, we will make it happen. Um, so we're going to offer that. Maybe there's somebody you know who's missing somebody this Christmas. And just the act of coming to a place of worship and just lighting a candle in remembrance of that person can bring some healing, can bring some comfort. Who do you know who's suffering this Christmas? And then also, maybe it's you. Maybe this Christmas, you feel like you're struggling, you're suffering, you're feeling broken, you're feeling like, oh my gosh, every time I stand back up, I just get kicked again. And I want you to know for one thing, you're not alone. There's probably about 60% of the people in this room who feel like that right now. Like, you know, your whole family gets sick and then they finally get better. And then you find a mouse in the house, which happened to me yesterday. I know. We had a candle fire, so now our house stinks. My husband's sick. <sighs> You're like, all right, I got to get up and make a ham. <laughs> Thank God for Walmart grocery delivery. You're not alone. The stressors and the suffering and the difficulty that you face, you're not alone. But this is the important part. In your brokenness, you can still be given to the world. See, that's what I had to tell myself yesterday as I, was, as I was getting ready to come and do my job while I'm like, these are all the things that are on my mind. My kids are all going different directions. There's so much happening. And I'm just praying to God that I don't get sick too like everybody else in my house. Like all of those things. And God just said, in your weakness, I am strong. And God has been telling me lately, if you were here last week, we talked during communion about brokenness. I always feel like I have to be like in top form in order to help somebody else. And I'm finding out that in our brokenness is how we're given to the world. Don't be afraid of your brokenness. Don't be afraid of your suffering. Don't be afraid to let yourself be given to somebody else, even when you're not feeling right yourself, because nobody feels right all the time. And if we all waited till we were fabulous, we would never reach out to anybody else and we would never experience the healing that we need. I believe that it is in the reaching out and blessing somebody else during our hurting time that we find our healing. And I know it's counterintuitive. It's kind of like when you feel crappy, go to the gym, and then you feel better. I'm like, that sounds like a terrible idea. But then you find that it helps. My counselor says, Kelly, you are wired in a way that you need to go do fun things. I'm like, I am too dang tired to go do fun things. I don't even wanna schedule a fun thing. And he's like, but you have to, because it's when you do the things that honor how God's wired you is when you find the healing and the joy that you're looking for. So this season, look around, even if you're the one who's hurting, 
and reach out to someone else because it's in doing the things that we are created to do that we find the healing and the help and the joy that we need ourselves. Number two, person at the manger was Joseph, Jesus' father, Jesus' stepdad. You know, Jesus was raised by a stepdad and major props to all of those who are raising somebody else's kids. We need you. My dad raised me, I was not his, but he decided I was, and I needed a dad, and he was a great one, he still is. He even talked to me on the phone yesterday, and he hates talking on the phone. But when you get him talking, he does not stop. Jesus' father represents the surprised. See, Joseph, he had like this really great life. See, in that culture, in order to get married, you had to be able to save up a year's wages. So that meant that a lot of times they didn't get married till they were a little older and able to save up a year's wages. So Joseph was probably middle-aged or I don't know what middle age is. I keep saying it's older than me, whatever that is. Um, but think about his life before Jesus. I know, right? Uh, he was making good money as a carpenter. He'd saved a year's salary and asked for a girl's hand in marriage. He was in love. He was looking forward to the future. And then surprise, his world was turned upside down. The girl he loved was pregnant. She said it was not his. Oh, well, I mean, it wasn't his. She said it was from God. Hey, baby, I'm pregnant. Don't worry, it wasn't anybody else. It was God. I mean, what? Think about that. Is she crazy? Is she lying? Then an angel told him in a dream to marry her, and he followed God, so he said, okay. So then he's raising God's son as his own. All of his plans for a normal, happy life turned upside down. I think Joseph's theme song was, so no one told you life was going to be this way. I feel like Joseph just walked around through his whole life like this. <laughs> Who do you know who's been surprised or shocked by life this Christmas? They looked at you and they said, nobody told me life was going to be this way. This is not what I thought was going to happen. I thought I was going to pursue the American dream and I was going to have, you know, a house and two cars and 2.5 kids and a dog that pees on the floor and like all the things that normal people have. And instead, here I am divorced and, uh, you know, feeling alone, or here I am dealing with this diagnosis, or here I am dealing with this, or like, what? All around us are people who life has just blindsided. Who do you know that this Christmas, they're looking around going, no one told me life was gonna be this way. Maybe that's the person you need to include around the manger this Christmas. I'm not saying you have to like adopt them into your family and have them spend the night. I'm just saying, what if you invited them to church? What if you sent a note? What if you prayed with them? What if you said, God's gonna get you through this surprise? And this is my favorite thing to say to myself and others. My friend told me this years ago and it stuck in my head. I think I even wrote it in one of my books. God is not up in heaven going and biting his nails over your situation. God never goes, oops. Like, God never says, oops. Think about that. He's never like, oh, I missed that one. The nature of earth and a sinful world that we live in is that there are difficulties and there are suffering. That's just part of being here. But we are created for eternity. So yeah, we do have to endure for a little while, but God's glory is gonna overwhelm that. So in this time, who can you reach out to who's been blindsided by something this holiday? And maybe that's you. And I want you to know that he is not far off. He hasn't missed you. He hasn't forgotten about you. He will walk through you, through it with, through you with, it. wow. I said I didn't have enough coffee. He'll walk through it with you. Ha, I got it. But you're not alone. Number three, shepherds. They represent the social outcast. Did you know that? 
this is new. Hey, this is new information from the Christmas story. So this really great author, his name is Randy Alcorn, he uh, did The Treasure Principle, which we used his book as a launching point for the last teaching series that we did. He wrote this whole chapter about the shepherds and gave us a little more perspective on the shepherds in the community at that time. And this was really interesting. Shepherd status by Randy Alcorn, we just kind of put it up here. They were dirty, obviously they were with sheep all the time, uneducated and underpaid. Like if you could do something better, you would not be a shepherd. Their testimony was not admissible in court. Think about that. They are such non-entities in that culture that if they witnessed a crime, nobody wanted to hear about it because they couldn't trust them. Imagine going through life that much of a non-entity, considered untrustworthy by the rabbis of the day. The rabbis, the pastors considered them untrustworthy and said negative things about them. The pastors, that's so mean. Rabbis of Jesus' day wrote, how could God be called the good shepherd in Psalm 23? You know, like the Lord is my shepherd. There are no good shepherds. That's so harsh. It reminds me of another verse in scripture where somebody said, can anything good come from Nazareth? And they were talking about Jesus. I feel like there was another one, Todd. Oh, here we go. Uh, there are no good shepherds. They were on the lowest rung of society. They shared the same status as tax collectors, prostitutes, and dung sweepers. The shovelers. That's the status they had. God sent angels from heaven to tell some people that the Messiah was born. And he chose the people who nobody would believe. That just doesn't seem very efficient. I think that what God is trying to say here is, you do not have to have status to matter in God's kingdom. Nobody has to trust you. Nobody has to look up to you or respect you. God chooses you. And he showed up to those shepherds his mighty warrior angels, the forces of heaven's army, in that moment when heaven invaded earth, showed up to shepherds. And you know what those shepherds could have done? They could have been sitting out there around their fire that night, smoking some pot. I don't know, I mean, they're bored, whatever. And they're like, dude, did that just happen? They're like, yeah, we should go tell someone. Sorry, <laughs> I just thought that was funny. They're like, nobody would believe us, man. And instead they were like, you know what? We're gonna do what God said. We're gonna do what he said. We're gonna go tell somebody. And screw it, if they don't believe me, nobody can argue with my story. It is what it is. And that's us. That's us, the ones who maybe people didn't trust us, people didn't believe us, social outcast, not the cool kid. And God shows up and he does something in our lives. It's our responsibility to go tell somebody. We're not supposed to keep it to ourselves. It doesn't matter if people trust us or believe us. We go tell somebody anyway. But I want you to think for a second, who do you know who's kind of a social outcast like that? And in our world that is so plagued with addiction, I think a lot of times it's those who are addicted. I think it's a lot of times those who just struggle to keep everything straight. That people kind of push back. And so they're kind of a social outcast. Sometimes it's those who have abused and hurt their family time and again because of their addiction or because of their struggle. And their family's like, I don't know, man. I just, we got to take a step away. Maybe that's our opportunity to take a step in and to include them. Social outcasts, they look a little bit different, just different ways. Maybe somebody with not many friends, not well liked, a bad reputation, made some pretty bad choices. Maybe in and out of jail, 
You know what? Sometimes this church is people's first stop when they get out of prison. That's the coolest thing to be able to welcome somebody into the family because they've been out for a while. Maybe an addict, an alcoholic, a drug abuser, somebody who's always high. Maybe somebody that everybody calls a walking disaster. God is calling them to the Christmas party. And God will use us. If we don't include them, who will? And this is important, back to the brokenness thing. We can't be afraid of their brokenness. We can't be afraid of brokenness. We can't look at somebody and say they're too broken. Nobody is too broken for God. It is simply our job to wrap our arms around them and hug them. And you know what? A lot of times people's uh, stigma, the social stigma, or um, sometimes we feel more stigmatized than we actually are. It can be in our own heads. Sometimes the way we feel about ourselves makes us believe that we are an outcast, but we're not really, because Satan just wants to mess with our heads, right? He wants to tell us that we're not worthy and that people don't like us. And that when we walk into a room, we have all of our failures written on our forehead and everybody can see it. But you know what? That's not true. Most of us are too consumed with our own issues to worry about yours. Sometimes we just got to let it down and just be like, you know what? We're all, we're all just, you know, sitting by yourself at the lunchroom sometimes. I told my dad yesterday, we were talking on the phone. He never gets movie jokes because he doesn't watch movies. So I said a movie line and he, my mom said something and I was like, oh, it's from a movie. And my dad's like, oh, yeah, well, I never get those jokes. And I was like, and that's why you're not invited to the cool kids' table. And he laughed, and then he goes, wait, is that a line from a movie, too? <laughs> I said, no. That's your oldest daughter being funny, Dad. Your failures, your guilt, your shame that you think you're wearing all over, a lot of times people can't see it. This is kind of a diversion from the actual point of this message, but I want to know sometimes it's our own assumptions that cause us to not let other people care about us and love about us, love us. So uh, something funny happens to me every now and then. So my mom raised me to be nice to people. I'm from Alabama, so I hug. Um, and it is really funny at times, it's scary, but also funny, to like be in the store in Elk River somewhere and see somebody who has left my church. So people leave our church all the time. People come through our church. It's very rare that people come to our church and never leave, right? So that's fine, because we're just a part of people's journeys. It's okay. Some people just wander away. Some people leave mad because they decide they don't like us, whatever. Uh, some people, God moves them on to another ministry. I don't know. Whatever the reasons are, I've given up even trying to like concern myself too much, because that would make you crazy. But I'll see somebody in the store, and I'll be like, they used to go to my church. And, you know, like, if I actually, like, know they've been horrible, I'll try to, like, run and hide. But if, but this has happened more than once where I'll see somebody, I'll be like, oh, my gosh, hi, and I'll give them a hug. I'll be like, I haven't seen you in forever. And they stand there like this. <laughs> it's so great because in that moment, I'm like, oh, they must have said bad things about me, and they don't. <laughs> And they think I know, but I don't. It is so fantastic, the look on the face, you know, and they're, I'm like, I'm just hugging you. I'm making you feel so awkward right now. But why hold on to something I don't really even know about? But in their own mind, I should hate them. It's super fun to be the grace of God to people, isn't it? Because God gives that grace to us. And sometimes we gotta get over ourselves and what we think people see when they look at us and just let ourselves be hugged, let ourselves be cared about. And then conversely, who do you know who has some kind of a social stigma that prevents them from feeling loved and accepted by society? That's somebody that needs to be included in the Christmas party. Uh, number four, right? Yeah, the wise men. 
The wise men, they represent the searching. Okay, so these guys showed up a little bit later. I think Jesus was in his house uh, by the time they showed up. So these were people who were educated scholars. They were astrologers. They were always looking for signs in the sky. So they followed the star that led them to Jesus. But along the way, they were asking questions. They stopped for directions, all of this. Uh, they were seeking answers, asking questions, searching for truth. They were looking for God. They came prepared with offerings, with gold, frankincense, and, well, you know, your Christmas story. Like they came prepared to worship. They were just trying to find God. Who do you know who's like that this Christmas? We're all created with a need to worship somebody or something. Do you know somebody who always feels like they're trying to find what it is is the next thing that's going to fulfill them? what they're going to worship, the next thing that's going to make them feel like, oh, I have it all together, whether it's the next app. I'm always looking for an app that's going to solve all my problems, you know, but it can't cause me too much work because then that's hard. Or every time you talk to them about God, they say, yeah, but what about? Yeah, but what about? The one we never have an answer to is yeah, but what about all the people who do horrible things in the name of God? And you're like, uh, and they're like, yeah, Christians are horrible. Some Christians do horrible things, just like some other religion people do horrible things. But the answer is always not what are they doing, because that's a smokescreen. That's trying to point to somebody else. The question is, what are you going to do with God? The question is, what are you going to do? Because we can only be responsible for ourselves and sharing our story and what we know. So who do you know who seems like they're always searching? Who seems like they're looking for answers? They're seeking, and, and they'll read that next like self-help book. Nothing wrong with self-help books, but I get much more help from God than I do self-help books because my self fails frequently. Do you know somebody like that? who maybe you could include around the manger this Christmas, who maybe you could invite to church for a Christmas Eve service, who maybe you can just say, hey, I don't know what you're going to choose to believe, but this is my story. Yeah. One thing people can't argue with is your story. Amen. It is what it is. You may not like it, but it's my story. Or maybe that searching person is you. Maybe you're a believer but you're like trying to find God's will and you're obsessed right now with trying to make the right decision. Does anybody else feel like before you can make a decision, you have to know 1000% that it's going to not fail? That is me. Yeah. You too, Joy. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm like, I'm a strong leader who makes decisions as long as I'm very, very sure it's right. Which, of course, we never really are, right? A good leader taught us once, if you're about 75% right, you're doing good. You should probably just go with it. I mean, 75% sure. So maybe this Christmas you are searching. You're like trying to make the next decision. You're trying to make a choice. You're trying to know what to do next. You're trying to figure out what God has for you next. And you feel like you're seeking and you feel like you're searching. What if you just took one day at a time following Jesus with your whole entire heart and let him roll out that red carpet for you that you're going to walk down? That's the best way to go because your life is made up of single steps. And if you take a single step following him, following the star like the wise men, maybe you need to ask for some wisdom around, along the way, but you got to keep following. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on scripture and the wisdom found there. Keep your heart undistracted by all the other things. And just one step at a time, maybe you'll find him this Christmas. But if you had the faith to ask him to reveal himself to you this Christmas when was the last time you just said, you know what, God, I don't know what to do. Will you just reveal it? Will you show me? And sometimes we miss it. I was talking to a friend. She was here last night. Somebody had handed her uh, some money. And she was like, I can't take that. I can't take that. But, you know, they were done and gone. And she's holding this money. She's like, what am I supposed to do with this? I was like, use it. <laughs> like, buy something. I don't know. <laughs> get some food. I don't know. Like, cause you know, she's not like super broke or anything. And I was like, or give it away, like find somebody else to give it to, which kind of made her feel a little bit better. It was super awkward for her. She's like, I don't know why. I don't know. This makes me so. And then she texted me later that night, like two hours later. 
And she goes, I was feeling super anxious about that money. And then I realized that I had given most of my spending money in the offering and asked God to provide to buy my husband's Christmas present. And I'm like, all caps, look what God did for you. And she's like, I know, and I almost missed it. Sometimes we ask and then we forget to notice. So these are the VIPs this Christmas, the suffering, the surprised, social outcast, the searching. What if this Christmas you functioned like the star and pointed one of those VIPs to Jesus? What if you just opened your mouth and talked to him? What if you shot him a text and invited him to come to Christmas Eve service with you? We have like 72 Christmas Eve services. They're in your program. That was an exaggeration. That's called pastor math. But in your program, there's a big list of all the different services. We even have one that we're going to stream online. But what if you invited somebody for Christmas to gather with you around the manger? What might happen? Jesus saves the suffering. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Jesus restores the soul of the surprised. He says, come to me, you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you what? Rest. Jesus befriends the social outcast. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus was like, heck yeah. These are my people. He didn't care about status, wealth, what they could do for him. He only knew what he could offer them, which was just a shoulder to cry on, somebody to stand with. God reveals truth to the searching. I want you to know your doubting is safe with God. He's not afraid of your doubts, just like he's not afraid of your brokenness. He's not afraid of your questions or your doubts. Eight days later, this after Jesus raised from the dead, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas, the disciple, was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, boom, Jesus was standing there. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Thomas, I know you were doubting, but here, put your finger and look at my hands. Put your hand in the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer, believe. And Thomas replied, my Lord and my God. Whoever you wrote down, start praying now for God to open a door for a conversation. And if you are one of those, stay close to him this Christmas. Allow him to meet you in your difficulty, in your brokenness, in your confusion. Allow him to meet you there, but allow his family to meet you there too. Like Pastor Ted mentioned earlier, if you're feeling alone or you're hurting this Christmas, Pastor Reuben and Susie are right down here in the front. I know Sarah and Chris would be happy to pray with you. Pastor Silas and I over here, um, we would just love to give you, a, just to pray with you for a minute and ask God to just shower his blessing, his peace over you during this season. Let's pray. And before we wrap up, I just wanna give you a chance if you've not yet given your life to Jesus, Maybe today's your day to do that. You can just pray something like this. You can just say, Jesus, thank you for becoming flesh and living here among us. Thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for forgiving my sins. I give my life to you. I choose to follow you. Your way is better than mine. Walk through this life with me and take me to heaven when I die. Father God, I thank you for every life and I thank you that you are actively at work in each of our lives. Even when we feel like we're resisting you, your Holy Spirit's power is so much stronger than any natural power that tries to rise up against it. God, I pray that you will give peace to the brokenhearted, that you will mend the soul that is, is shattered right now. God, I pray that you will help us to be okay with our suffering and our brokenness, knowing that that's where you meet us. In our weakness, you are strong. Your power is made perfect in our weakness. And no matter how we feel about ourselves, like the shepherds, let us boldly go and tell the good news. Let us boldly open the door for somebody else who's hurting or questioning or confused. God, let us be your people 
this Christmas season and not just not get distracted by the things that don't matter. Let us look our families and the people we care about in the face and tell them that we love them. Things that so often we don't do for fear of being vulnerable or looking weak. Let us just be out there and not be afraid of brokenness. Let us know that all are welcome around the manger just as all are welcome around the foot of the cross. Let us be the carriers of your love and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.